we have folks from Japan and Australia and all over the US and probably other places as well. Um, so thank you for being with us this morning and this afternoon <laughs> and whatever time it might be where you are. Um, this is the second event of the Inner Desert Dialogue series and the theme of today's event is energy and infrastructure. This um, session is being recorded, so if um, you'd like to turn off your camera, if you feel more comfortable doing that, um, please feel free to do so. And um, you can also select your viewing experience by keeping the grid or spotlighting the speaker. That choice is totally up to you. Um, for assistance with any of these technical issues, feel free to chat Isley Fraser at any point um, during the dialogue today. And we'd like to begin today's roundtable by acknowledging that ASU's Tempe campus is situated on the ancestral lands of indigenous peoples and sovereign nations of the Salt River Valley, including the Akamela Odom and Peeposh nations, whose knowledge, expertise, and stewardship of the lands and waterways allow us to be here now. In addition, we acknowledge and honor all 23 indigenous nations in Arizona. We understand that land acknowledgements on their own are never enough. Um, but we hope that they reinforce the idea that care and action are needed at every level. Um, my name is Jada Opsch, for those who don't know me, and I'm one of the co-organizers of the series along with Megan Todd and Gary Rieger. We want to thank you all for being here, the presenters who will introduce shortly, as well as the attendees. And I also want to thank Isley Fraser, a teaching and learning specialist for the College of Integrative Sciences and Arts, who is helping us manage the technology for today's event. We couldn't be anywhere without Isley. <laughs> um, ASU's Institute for Humanities Research supported the Inner Desert Dialogues project by awarding our team with a seed grant. We have received additional support from ASU's Desert Humanities Initiative, headed by Jason Bruner, who might be here um, today or will be popping in shortly. The Environmental Humanities Initiative, headed by Joni Adamson, one of our presenters, and the College of Integrative Sciences and Arts. These individuals and programs help make this series possible, and we're immensely grateful for their support. As the flyer for Dialogue 2 noted, today's event will examine deserts as sites of extraction, energy generation, infrastructure development, healing, and transformative justice. Megan, Gary, and I are inspired by the idea that interdisciplinary conversations about desert environments can open people up to the complex stories, lives, and histories that exist in what Joni Adamson calls the middle place, where nature and culture intersect. Such a framing, Adamson argues in her work, encourages us to be responsible to each other and to the places we inhabit. Liz Tynan extends Adamson's engagement of the human and the natural by calling attention to what she calls the, quote, accumulating strata of Maralinga, a heterotopic atomic testing site in South Australia that, like all atomic landscapes, remains contaminated. Tynan's essay emphasizes that, quote, to the first residents, Maralinga, Maralinga was not barren or deserted. Instead, it was home to many. In Trinitite, Turquoise, and Rattlesnakes, Kyoko Matsunaga examines two different but related nuclear landscapes and explores narrative strategies for de-weaponizing atomic sites in the works of Leslie Mormon Silko and Kyoko Hayashi. Both writers, Matsunaga argues, go beyond the unnatural impact of nuclearization in their work to reclaim land, memory, and identity. Finally, Lauren Redness's work of graphic nonfiction, Oak Flat, A Fight for Sacred Land in the American West, explores a place filled with power, a kind of power that resolution copper cannot commodify. Through drawings, interviews, and des descriptive narrative, Redness explores the diverse cultural, political, and geological stories that emerge from a contested site in southeastern Arizona. The book ends with the words of Wensler Nosy of the San Carlos Apache tribe. Quote, if you go back to the beginning, everything was dark. You start from nothing. Things start to come to light. In that spirit of bringing things to light, I'm excited to introduce our four presenters. Together, these individuals who represent a range of disciplines and experiences, read energy and infrastructure and desert environments through the overlapping lenses of culture, environment, and justice. Their work shows us how cultural productions that center Adamson's middle place can create and contribute to powerful counter narratives, social and environmental justice movements, and ultimately meaningful connections to desert places, 
even places impacted by intensive resource extraction, nuclear contamination, and other acts of settler colonial violence. Before I turn things over to Megan, who will introduce today's speakers, I want to add that we welcome your comments and questions throughout the dialogue. Feel free to use the chat, raise your hand, or unmute yourself at any point. Additionally, we have enabled the closed captioning feature for any attendee who would like to access it. Megan will now offer a brief introduction of the presenters, and then each presenter, in the same order, will tell us a little bit about their work and provide some context about the desert artifacts submitted um, before we begin the dialogue. I'll turn it over to Thank Megan. Thank you so much, Dita. Um, you can read the longer bios and the link that was dropped into the chat, but I'll just give a brief synopsis um, of each of the presenters and some of their accomplishments. Joni Adamson is President's Professor of Environmental Humanities in the Department of English and Distinguished Global Futures Scholar at the Julie Ann Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory, that's a mouthful, at ASU. She is founding director of the flagship hub of UNESCO Bridges Sustainability Science Coalition, located in the Rob and Melanie Walton Center for Planetary Health. She also directs the Environmental Humanities Initiative, a collaborative of Global Futures Laboratory and the Institute for Humanities Research. Adamson is the author and or co-editor of nine books and special issues and more than 90 articles, chapters, reviews, and blog posts. She writes on environmental justice, the centrality of environmental humanities to the sustainability sciences, Indigenous literatures and scientific literacies, the rights of nature movement, and the food justice movement. Welcome, Jonique. Um, and Kyoto Matsunaga is an associate professor at Hiroshima University and a former Fulbright Fellow at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. She specializes in Indigenous North American literature, nuclear atomic literature, and environmental literature. Born and brought up in Hiroshima, Kyoko came to be interested in the post-colonial and intercultural nuclear connections in East Asia and across the Pacific. Her recent publications include essays in Hiroshima and Peace Studies, Reading Aridity in Western American Literature, the Journal of Transnational American Studies, Eco-Criticism in Japan, and the book American Indigenous Writers and Nuclear Literature, From Apocalypse to Survivance. Welcome, Kyoko. And Elizabeth Tynan, Associate Professor, uh, she's an Associate Professor and Coordinator of the Professional Development Program at James Cook University Graduate Research School in Townsville, Australia. She is also a prominent researcher of the historic history of British atomic weapons tests in Australia. Her PhD from Australian National University examined aspects of the British nuclear tests in Australia in the 50s and 60s. Her book, Atomic Thunder, the Maralinga Story, won the Council of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences Australia Prize for a Book in 2017 and the Prime Minister's Literary Award for Australian History in 2017. The follow-up book, The Secret of Emu Field, was published in May 2022. It investigates the history of the earlier British atomic test site in South Australia, Emu Field. Welcome, Liz. And finally, last but not least, Lauren Redness is an author, artist, and the recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. Her book, Thunder and Lightning, Weather, Past, Present, Future, won the 2016 Penn E. O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award. Radioactive Marie and Pierre Curie, A Tale of Love and Fallout was a finalist for the National Book Award. And her most recent book, which Jada spoke of, is Oak Flat, A Fight for Sacred Land in the American West. She has been a Guggenheim Fellow, a fellow at the New York Public Library's Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers and the New America Foundation. She was artist in residence at the American Museum of Natural History in 2013. And in 2020 um, was the New York City Ballet's featured visual artist at Lincoln Center. She teaches at Parsons School of Design in New York City. Welcome Lauren. 
And um, now each presenter will take about 10 minutes to share a little about their work, their background and the desert artifacts that they'd shared with you. And in order to leave enough time for group dis discussion, we ask that you keep it to about 10 minutes. And um, Isley will pop a message in the chat if you're at 10 minutes, just to give you a heads up and we'll try to wrap it up. So with no further ado, Joni, take it away. <laughs> Oh, you're muted. Okay, I, can you hear me now? Yes. All right, um, are we able to share our screens? Yes. You okay. Should. That feature should be enabled. Then I am going to change this to presenter view. D do you have presenter view yet? You do? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I don't see the presenter view. We're looking at the slides. Let's see. How's that? Oh. I, right now it's a black screen, but I think it's, oh, I think it's popping up there. All right, so today I just wanna talk briefly about my first book, The Middle Place. Um, even though I wrote it uh, several years ago, I still think that many of the themes uh, that I discussed in the in the monograph are still relevant to discussions of deserts and extraction. And um, I'm really interested to hear the presentations today, and I'm really honored to be on the panel today with the 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 people I'm I'm go going to be on the panel with. And thank you so much to. Um, to um, Jada and the whole team for putting this together. So my first book was called The Middle Place and it was the first monograph to uh, um, define environmental justice literature. So it was the first critique of eco-criticism from an environmental justice perspective. Um, I really wanted to critique the idea that was developing in early eco-criticism that, that you know, environmental liter literature was just gonna look at the the relationship between literature and the physical environment. Um, I had spent um, the previous nine years before I published this book uh, working on the Atam Nation, the Tona Atam Nation, uh, driving from the University of Arizona where I worked all the way out to Sells, Arizona, um, which is the capital of the Atam Nation. And so this is just a little bit, a little map of the Sonoran Desert that I was driving through it took me two hours to get to a high school where I was working with um, college prep uh, students um, at, at um, San Simone High School on the Atham Nation. And so every week I would drive out through the saguaro forest and it was beautiful and we would see all kinds of wildlife, coyotes, Gila monsters, um, you know, javelina. It was just beautiful. And Really, you know, if you're driving on a highway through country like this, you could really become sort of romantic about this place. Um, and many people do drive through this place. It is so beautiful that they become sort of romantic about this place. But as I uh, stopped at um, uh, Baba Kivri High School and then San Simon High School to teach two different classes, um, this would be my view from the high school. If you looked out the front window of the high school, this was the view. Baba Kivri Peak, the sac sacred mountain of the Tonga Atam people. And from my students, I was, for those entire nine years, the only white person in the room. All of my students, both during the school year and over the summer when I taught these uh, special courses, um, were all... Uh, um, American Indian or uh, American um, Native students. And so I learned so much from them. And one of the things that we talked about were, of course, these beautiful places on the Optum Nation, but we had discussions about things like bighorn sheep and the reasons why they were no longer there, or the petroglyphs and the reasons why you could no longer get to the places where those petroglyphs were. And it was because, um, you know, the, the 
the same forces that draw lines of protection around certain places like the Cabeza de Prieta National Wildlife Mo Monument were at simultaneously drawing lines around other places like the Barry Goldwater Bombing Range and the US uh, military would practice bombing on this piece of what used to be the Upham traditional lands. And that was one of the reasons why there were no longer um, bighorn sheep there and why you couldn't get to some of the petroglyphs. So I became really interested in the, um, the, the, the tribal groups around the American Southwest, particularly in the deserts that were fighting these um, battles you know for their land and for their water and many of my students were really concerned at the time about Black Mesa and I won't go into Black Mesa this mine has since been closed the uh, coal burning plant has since been closed in other words a lot of the activism around Black Mesa was eventually successful and the um, coal burning plant has been uh, uh, um, shut down but you see some of the issues here. For example, when this coal slurry was running, it um, drained 3000 gallons per minute of the only source of drinking water uh, for the entire region. And this impacted both the Hopi and the Diné tribes. And so they were fighting these battles uh, for many years before they finally eventually um, had an impact. So in the book, I'm looking at uh, the, the writings of Simon Ortiz and Ophelia Zepeda, uh, Joy Harjo, Leslie Marmasoko, Scott Mamade, and I was so lucky to be the student of all of these writers. I was really privileged to be in the classroom with all of these writers and to become really familiar with the issues that they were thinking about. And one of those issues was, of course, about sacrifice zones. In 1973, the Nixon administration, the same administration that passed the Clean Air and the Clean uh, Water Act, also uh, created this concept of the sacrifice zone, which was that the nation could sacrifice areas that, you know, for the greater good of the nation. Um, and of course, there were always people and plants and animals living in those places. And so um, the environmental justice uh, community started raising questions about what does it mean to, to be declared a sacrifice zone um, and what happens to the sacrifice peoples and the sacrifice animals and the relationships in those ecologies. And so I look at different um, poems, including uh, this one, that's the place the Indians talk about, um, about Coso Hot Springs in California, a California desert. And Simon Ortiz in this poem talks about the relationship of um, indigenous peoples to this place. Before World War II, they could go there, they could um, wash in the sacred waters, um, they could listen to the hot springs, they could hear the stones rattling. They, they considered that the earth was talking to them there at Coso Hot Springs. But since World War II, and I'll just read this stanza, the Navy of the government has a fence around that place. The people go there to talk with the hot springs, to use the power, to keep ourselves well. But there is a fence with locks all around and we have to talk with the Navy people so that they can let us inside to, uh, to the hot springs. And so this concept of the fence um, becomes a sort of symbol for the extractive uh, processes that sometimes draw uh, fences or borders around certain areas that are you know, preserved mainly usually for the dominant cultures of a nation while other, uh, while other borders are, are drawn to create these sacrifice zones. And so in the book, I, um, I, I'm just gonna read a, one quote from the book. Um, this is on page uh, 71 from Simon Ortiz's Fight Back, which is one of the desert artifacts. And, um, and Simon Ortiz talks about the Shoshonean people that would go to talk to the hot springs. And so for the Shoshone and the American in, other American Indians people, the fight for sacred places and traditional homelands is not simply about preserving valued environmental qualities in a specific location or gaining deep experiential knowledge of nature. And that's the reason why I, in the book, I'm questioning this concept of wilderness and I'm questioning the concept of first white man who discovers, you know, something. 
For the indigenous people, unique geological features within their homelands are often alive with mythic, historic, and sacred meaning of their cultures. These places are expressive of a particular way of life, and when threatened, they became, become symbols of a threat to distinctive cultural identities. So the fence surrounding Coso Hot Springs um, stands as a stark reminder that contemplative reflection on nature's wonders cannot of itself lead to a clear understanding of the processes at work when one culture disturbs or destroy, destroys the basis of another culture's identity and violates a people, people's human rights by making the continued practice of their traditional life ways difficult or impossible. And so in the middle place, which I was really afraid to publish actually, because uh, you know, uh, in those days, Edward Abbey walked on water. And I, I, I wrote this while I was a graduate student. And so of course I thought my career was gonna be over the minute that this got published because all the Edward Abbey fans would come after me. But I'm still to this day really proud of, of the work that I did in the book because Edward Abbey for all of his many, um, you know, good qualities and his um, very influential work was arguing that Navajo women, Dene women should be sterilized. That is like a shocking, a shocking and very racist, very sexist, misogynistic sort of perspective to take. And so I wanted my readers to see that racism, um, sexism, you know, misogyny, it's all connected to environmental injustices and inequities. And hopefully this uh, discussion about sacrifice zones and environmental justice will continue um, with, with this, these desert dialogues and with all of the work that, all of the great work that you all are doing. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for that, Joni. Oh, sorry, Megan, I wasn't sure. <laughs> um, yeah, next up we have Kyoko. And we'll definitely continue yeah, this conversation um, after the presentations for sure. So thank you for that. Um, can you see the slide? Okay, good. Well, thank you, uh, Jada, Gary, and Megan for organizing this wonderful event. And I um, and I'm very honored and happy to be here today. And I read all of the other presenters' um, work, and I was so fascinated by just being part of it. So thank you so much. It's a humid morning here in uh, Hiroshima, but I en enjoyed my uh, morning walk with my four-legged companion, Daisy. Uh, she is now uh, in the living room so that she doesn't bother me. And uh, I was born and brought up in Hiroshima. And Hiroshima, uh, this, this time of the year is lush green with uh, rain and humidity. This is a photo of Shuken uh, in downtown Hiroshima, a Japanese garden commissioned by Lord Asano in 1620. After the US government dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Shuken became a shelter for refugees. The Kyobashi River flows uh, past the park. After the atomic bombing, many people uh, died there craving water. And people say that we can still find some bones in some of the rivers in Hiroshima. And you see bottles of water and tea in front of the cenotaph uh, because uh, many people wanted water and some of the people who visited this park thought that they should give water to those who died. And you might also know this place uh, as Asano Park in John Hersey's Hiroshima. Uh, John Hersey doesn't use the word shuken, but uh, he uses the word Asano Park, which was used uh, by uh, many of the Hiroshima people who are living there at the time. 
oh, sorry, Hiroshima after the bomb became a barren landscape with water, which was likely to be contaminated with radiation. And people were told they would die if they drank water. And uh, people who had been exposed to black rain with uh, radioactive fallout suffered from cancer or other related illnesses. Interestingly, uh, Ellen Mello in The Last Cheater's Waltz refers to the photographs of Hiroshima after the bomb as a desert. This uh, might be one of the images Meloy witnessed. In the middle of this photo, you see uh, the atomic bomb dome. And then this is the uh, near epicenter. This is near the epicenter where, uh, the, uh, so where the bomb was dropped. As many of you already know, um, in nuclear discourse, the term desert has often been associated with emptiness and remoteness. And the association has legitimized the construction of nuclear infrastructure, including labs, uranium mines, test sites, and waste disposal sites. And writers such as Ellen Meloy, Leslie Mamunsilko, and uh, of course, uh, Simon J. Ortiz reveal the ways that term desert has been used to rationalize the construction of nuclear infrastructure. And then reminds us uh, of uh, concealed water, amphibians such as toes and frogs. And of course, uh, in, um, animate and inanimate features that make up what has been dismissed as desert. The desert, uh, both terminologically and geographically, is a military and settler colonial space, and this is symbolically depicted in ceremony. Teo, a mixed blood indigenous character, drinks water uh, near the shaft of a uranium mine. Says, uh, it says it is bitter, and he thinks it could be because of uranium. So concealed and contaminated water is part of the ecosystem to which Teo belongs. My artifact uh, points to uh, another settler colonial and military connection in Silko's work, which hasn't been talked much uh, before. So in ceremony, the protagonist meets a Japanese mother and her son after he comes back from the Philippine jungle where he experienced the Baton Death March. This brief scene uh, alludes to desert connection between indigenous nations and people of Japanese descent. So during World War II, Japanese American internment camps were established in the areas considered barren and uh, remote. Uh, for example, uh, Poston was located in the lower Sonoran Desert. So you see Poston right here, uh, which was part of the Colorado River Indian Reservation. So in order to uh, relocate, um, other indigenous people to the Colorado River Indian Reservation after the war, uh, the military, the War Relocation Authority, and the Office of Indian Affairs used Poston internees uh, during the war to construct an irrigation system, make roads, cultivate land for agriculture, and construct uh, school buildings. So based on this history, uh, Cynthia Kadohata depicts the desert as an intercultural, military, and uh, settler colonial space in her young adult novel entitled uh, Weed Flower. The novel is about uh, Sumiko, who was removed from her homeland in Southern California to be interned in Boston. In the novel, uh, Sumiko adjusts to this arid space by gardening and comes to realize that she is a settler in the homeland of the Colorado uh, River Indians. So I have a couple of slides uh, that talk about how she was, um, she, what kind of relationship she had before she moved to Poston, Arizona. So uh, in Japanese culture, taking bath is very, very important. Uh, I mean, 
we have public bath where uh, people go and then take bath with a bunch of other people you might not know at all. And for Sumiko to uh, bath is very important. So when you read this text, you see a lot of uh, scenes where uh, bath water is depicted. But then when she moves to Arizona, uh, what she encounters is dust. So dust is depicted quite a lot uh, at the beginning of the uh, time when she moved to Poston, Arizona. And then uh, she starts to, well, her fascination is uh, growing uh, some carnation and some flowers and especially cloths. So she starts to grow some of the uh, ksabana, some of the wheat flower uh, on in, inside the internment camp. And then she starts to feel that she has some connection with the land by doing that. And her view toward uh, post on Arizona's land start to change throughout the text. Uh, meanwhile, uh, she uh, meets uh, Frank Mojave, uh, who has been living there for a long time uh, with their uh, with his uh, family members and then the uh, people. And this is. So this is one of the scenes they uh, talk about land. So Sumiko says, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Frank says, this is our land. And Sumiko says, it's ours for now. Anyway, you weren't using it. And then uh, Frank says, what is it with you? You think you have to be using land for it to be worth something? So what Frank is pointing out is quite similar to what the government was doing. They thought that the uh, people who are living here, uh, meaning Mojave and Shimelvi, were not using land at all. So they were wasting land. So they wanted to cultivate the land. And they brought the uh, Japanese Americans there so that they can cultivate the land. And so they have some kind of interaction, cultural interaction, and there are a lot of scenes where Sumiko learns about Mojave and then where Frank learns about uh, Japanese culture and then the life of internees. Uh, so one of the things I'm interested in is how art and literature, uh, such as this text by Silko and uh, Kadohata reveal how the uh, Southwestern desert is a culturally, militarily, and colonially uh, layered space. And I don't think I have time to talk about the second artifact. And then I think uh, Jada, you kind of summarize it for me. So I'll finish my talk here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyoko. Those, there's already so many generative connections between Joni's presentation and yours, thinking about relocation zones and sac or sacrifice zones and relocation camps. And I can't wait to dive into more of them. Um, Liz, welcome. Oh, thank you so much. And, and the talk so far I have just got my head buzzing. Um, I'm, uh, I'm just so pleased to be in this company today and to be able to share what I describe in my own work as a great Australian secret. Uh, one of the, um, the most significant events of Australian history that almost no one knows anything about. And that of course was deliberate. Uh, it was um, policy to suppress information about what was going on in the Australian desert in South Australia. And also um, at the Montebello Islands off the coast of Western Australia. And, and Gary knows that we, uh, we talked a bit about that when I was over in Perth recently. But before I start, I would like to pay my respects to the elders past and present of the Woolgabru, Kabar and Bindul lands where I'm speaking to you from today in beautiful North Queensland. And also, in addition, pay my respects to the Anangu people of uh, the Maralinga Jarrajar lands uh, in South Australia, who are, uh, have reclaimed custodianship of the lands that they were um, expelled from during the times of the, uh, the atomic tests in the, the 1950s and 60s, and continue their stewardship by helping to heal the country. Um, I am in awe of their resilience and their capacity to take on a task which is um, beyond comprehension to try and heal the lands that were desecrated by the British atomic tests. 
Now I'm going to, um, oh, and I should just mention too, um, that Anangu people are part of uh, Aboriginal um, occupation of the Australian continent that dates back 60,000 years. It's the longest continuing culture in the world. And um, there are many of us who feel extremely proud that uh, we have um, the, the precious gift of such a long continuing and very rich culture. Now, let me just, I, I actually have three screens here and uh, I'm just going to now um, endeavor to get this started so that you can see it. So just bear with me for one moment. Just a second while I share my screen. Now, you probably won't see it initially, but I'm hoping that as soon as I hit Okay, I'm, I'm thinking you can see it now. Um, I just wanted to begin with a quote from a significant politician in the process of uncovering that began in the mid 1970s in Australia. So some years after the atomic tests, the tests began in Australia in 1952 and continued until 1963. And then there was a period of of uh, rather uh, inadequate cleanup. The lands were handed back to the Australian government in 1968. But it was only some years later that, um, that the Australian government, which was extremely negligent in the way it dealt with the, the tests, uh, it was some years later that, um, that people started to notice that the lands had been um, desecrated. And an important person in this story is Tom Uren, who uh, was the de former Deputy Prime Minister. And he summed it up beautifully when he said, and the more questions we asked and the deeper we got into the issue, the more it looked like a Pandora's box. And he asked very important questions in the Australian Parliament um, that set in train, along with the work of whistleblowers and Aboriginal people themselves, uh, set in train a long period of uncovering. And I am proud to say that I'm part of that, the later era of uncovering now in my work as an historian of the atomic tests in Australia. Britain made a very fateful decision to undertake its fish and weapons trials and associated toxic experiments in my country. And that has had profound implications over generations. And you'll see a, uh, a secret image only fairly relatively recently declassified of um, the instant of the totem one test at Emu Field. My most recent book is about Emu Field, and I'll tell you about that place in a moment. Uh, it predated the tests at Maralinga. Most people have heard of Maralinga. Very few people have actually heard of Emu Field. But um, totem one, which you can see just at the moment of explosion, uh, caused untold damage to Aboriginal communities, particularly those to the northwest of the site, about 170 kilometres from the site, were enveloped by what is now known as the black mist, still a very mysterious scientific phenomenon, but which um, rolled over the land like a juggernaut. It was sticky and black and had a strange smell, and it um, arrived at places like Wallatina, an Aboriginal settlement and caused death and injury and, and long-term suffering and displacement. So that very moment you're seeing there had huge implications for um, people who were in the path of its residues. Now, my artifact is, is Lens Tree, and um, I just wanted to contextualise the tree. It's, oh, hang on. Um, I think this um, presentation is on a bit of a timer, so I'm going to have to watch that. Um, it's midway between Maralinga and Emu Field. So Maralinga is to the south of Emu. It's uh, 
roughly 200 kilometers, although I've driven on that road and it takes five hours to drive, even though it's only 200 kilometers, which is 120 miles. Um, look at the beautiful mulga trees and the salmon red sand there. It is beautiful country and that blue dome of the sky. In fact, the blue dome perhaps touched me more than anything, just the the immensity of the um, this sort of covering dome that um, that embraced this gorgeous desert country. Now, I'm just going to read, if you'll allow me, a very short excerpt from um, The Secret of Emu Field, my most recent book, because I just want you to understand where I'm coming from for um, at least some of my description of what went on. The shape of a Gothic window has been hewn into the sturdy trunk of the tree and filled in with white paint, giving off a faint echo of a medieval church. The word emu has been incised into the Gothic window and, and below sits an aluminium plaque, not the original, which was stolen years ago, that points back to Maralinga and forward to emu. One can easily imagine Len Bedell, the surveyor, and his men resting during their surveying and road building labours and feeling the need to leave a sign that they were there. They will have had Billy tea and tinned corned beef laughing all the while at Bedell's many jokes. Then they would have packed up their things and continued on, taking readings and measurements as they went, placing a Western grid over ancient land. Len Bedell is a legendary figure in Australian history, mid 20th century history. He um, surveyed not just Maralinga and Ingwe Field, but also the Woomera Rocket Range, which predated both of those sites where the British tested their post-war rocket technology. And he um, is celebrated by many as a pioneer, an important person. He built the roads through that area, not just the, between Maralinga and Emu, but many, many other roads as well. He was distressingly um, unmoved by the fact that he was encroaching upon the traditional lands of the Anangu people and their very rich and complex culture. Uh, and so he was among the white people who encroached into those lands and um, and quite willingly and without any apparent conscience designated certain places that were going to be destroyed. So I find him a, a contradictory character in many ways, an interesting person, uh, a, a very um, celebrated Australian figure but he was highly problematic. Now, one of the places he found was the emu field clay pan, which is the most amazing natural feature. And that's me looking at the water coming up from underneath the clay pan. The clay pan sealed the fate of uh, the emu field site because it was flat and long and was able to land military aircraft. So military aircraft landed there um, in huge numbers during a tiny little moment in time in 1953 when Emu Field became the centre of the universe for British bomb makers and their political masters. And although it was always um, a very um, restricted area and I was very uh, moved by what Joni had to say about the fence, well, there was a metaphorical fence here that's called the Defence Special Undertakings Act of 1952, which um, excised this land from Australia and restricted it to people who had security clearance. There was no actual fence around either Emu or Maralinga, but there was this metaphorical fence. But of course, these sorts of fences are always penetrable and a notorious story from the time of Maralinga was um, the Aboriginal family, the Milpuddy family, who not knowing about the legal restrictions on the land, walked in one night and camped by the, one of the bomb craters at Maralinga and became contaminated. And Edie Milpuddy, the, the wife, was pregnant and of course she lost her child. And they were brutally, the whole family were brutally shipped off to a mission 
um, down south. And just as a um, an extra um, brutality, the, their dogs were shot in front of them on the orders of the minister. So there are many stories like that associated with um, the uh, the tests in the South Australian desert. Now the name Maralinga is not actually from the land of the Anangu people. It means thunder, and it comes from an extinct Northern Territory Aboriginal language. And it was applied to the site in 1955, as I recall, by a government committee, which just is yet another marker of the uh, nuclear colonialism that was in play with, uh, with, this, um, with the tests. Uh, it's all the same. It's a very beautiful name, I think, and, and the place itself is very beautiful. However, it is still contaminated and it will be for hundreds of thousands of years into the future. So no one is allowed to spend much time there. You can't live there uh, on the site. And there are um, many parts of the site that you can't even briefly visit. Um, there is actually, though, rather remarkably, a tourism op operation run by Maralinga Jarajar Council, which takes tourists to the site. And we talk about that in the paper Untangling Maralinga as one of the, uh, the kind of paradoxical, interesting aspects uh, about how um, this desecrated site has been turned into something that helps Aboriginal people to reclaim what they lost, at least in a small part. I always get a, a, a shock even now seeing this picture. This is the atomic bombing of Australia. Um, this is a, a test known as Buffalo 3, which was the third in the Buffalo series in 1956. It's the only airdrop. All the others were from towers or from balloons or on the ground. Um, this is a V-bomber dropping a bomb over Maralinga, an atomic bomb. And there were people not far out of its range below and of course, many of the service personnel suffered greatly as well. Uh, and um, there are untold numbers of stories of servicemen, both British and Australian, and indeed US and Canadian and New Zealanders dying young as a result of their exposure. They were not um, given proper safety measures. And in many cases, they didn't even know what they were doing. And their military records do not show their service at Maralinga or EMU because it was so secret. And that did complicate them trying to get compensation later. So that's another aspect of the story as well. You can see that the desert is reclaiming the buildings. This is the airfield at uh, Maralinga and uh, the desert foliage is, uh, is coming back. And um, that is actually an amazing, very, uh, long, large air, airstrip that is still used, but the, uh, the, the airfield buildings are no longer used. And a, a large, you can see the desert coming back. It's, it's a, a very interesting process. And um, just to finish up quickly, um, the, there was a Royal Commission, which is a, a judicial inquiry into what happened. It was held in the mid 1980s after the, um, the work of Tom Uren, Avon Hudson, who was a whistleblower, Yami Lester, who was an Aboriginal person who um, was instrumental in putting pressure on the government. And the Royal Commission was held as a result and also of scientific scrutiny of the site. And the Royal Commission report was extremely damning, particularly of the way that um, Aboriginal people were treated. Here's just a brief quote. The 1963 trials, which were the final trials held at Maralinga, brought to an end a drama characterised by persistent deception and paranoid secrecy. In their desire to avoid international repercussions, the British authorities embarked on a course of determined concealment of information from the Australian government. The British were almost certainly in breach of international law with um, trials known as Vixen B, um, which uh, almost certainly went initially against the uh, moratorium that was established in 1958 and later the partial test ban treaty that came in in 1963. So they, um, they behaved abominably. 
but I feel that my time is probably up. Um, my colleagues, Darren Holden and Leander Burrows, uh, have been uh, a great source of inspiration for me. And we traveled together to EMU and to Maralinga. So on that note, I'll stop sharing and say thank you very much for your attention and for having me as part of this panel. I really appreciate it. Wow, thank you so much. So much untangling all of these paradoxes. And next up, welcome Lauren. Thank you so much, Liz. Hi, well, thank you so much for having me and to Jada and Gary and Megan and um, everyone who's organized this event and Isley for your tech support. Um, really um, incredible to hear the previous speakers and um, I hope that um, what I have to share dovetails or intersects in, in ways that are useful. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if I can find this. Um, oh, shoot. It's saying that I have to do some kind of system preference thing. Yikes. Um, I may need tech support. Um, when it's asking me to change my settings, it's asking you when you hit the share screen button at the bottom of the yeah i hit um i say share and then it says gives me the desktop option and then it says allow zoom to share a screen open okay open system preferences sorry and then i guess i have to go to zoom yeah if you're on a mac you're gonna have to give it preference to Use your camera. Um, okay, privacy. Let's see. Um, do you know where I would find that? In your uh, this Mac system preferences. I'm open mine now. Sorry, I'm not sure where this is. So, can I? jump in here. Um, if you go up to the top of your screen where, you know, maybe next to your Apple, if you're on a Mac, where it says, yeah. and you just drop that screen down, drop the menu down. The first one should be preferences. Okay, that I have. And then when I go just there. Go into preferences. And then um, there should be one that's called share screen. Do you see that? Are you, Lauren, are you on a, are you yeah. on a Mac? Yeah, I am on a Mac. Yeah, so Maybe. in your, if, if you opened up system preferences. Oh, yeah, and yeah. Then, and you go to security and privacy. So your, yeah. app, your app will know, right? Security and privacy. And then it said, then you, do you see the list where the cameras on the left? Okay, here's the curtain of privacy. Um, I don't see that. In your privacy, security and privacy, is that is that screen open for you? Yeah. If I can share. Yeah. Oh, and I see, I click on camera and Zoom is checked. Zoom is I checked? Yeah. Okay. Um, I could go to a different computer really quick if... um. If that seems worthwhile, but I don't know. If, I'm so sorry. Maybe let me ask my husband, Jody. Can you come here one sec? I'm so sorry. I it's not letting don't me share worry. my screen. Automatically share screen. Um. Did they, did they do the permission on your end? On yeah, Aaron? no one else has had a problem, so it's on my end for sure. Okay. Oh. I've literally never had this problem before. I don't understand. I'm so sorry. Oh my God. Am yeah. I now doing it? You're a hero. Thank you. Okay. Does it, are you seeing my shared screen? Yeah, yeah. it looks like a blank white screen. Is okay. that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh no. Oh, you're not seeing um, color images? 
No, I'm not yet. If you click oh, okay. share screen again, it, it might give you the list of options if you've got multiple screens. Oh, share, quick share. No. It's, it's you have to find your, what is this it's desktop? So that's what I'm trying to do and undo it. I'm so sorry. I don't know. I don't know. I could just go. If you hit, you. you can stop sharing. If you, if you if you do it again, it should give you your okay. option to do. Okay. Yeah, but then I do it one more time. Did it give you option? Um, it said I stopped sharing. Then I did it again. I said new share, same sure. issue. Yeah. It has like a kind of that exclamation point that looks ominous. Do you have multiple uh, screens? Just your laptop. Just my laptop. But my presentation isn't on you. Um, so close out your system preferences. It might be behind that. Let's see if you close. It might be. It's telling me that I'm it says participants can share your, can see your screen, but that's not the case, right? We do see your um, your system preference screen. It says Zoom. Oh. Yeah, I'm wondering, Megan just said in the chat that maybe um, if it's emailed to one of us, we could share it oh, on your yeah. behalf or, sure. or it could also be added to the um, shared folder. Maybe that would. Okay, sure. Let me try that. I'm going to. And no worries um, at all. These things happen. I'm so sorry. Okay. No, no, it's okay. Not a problem. Um, um, there are like so many intersections with all of these <laughs> incredible presentations. I was so excited. Okay. Um, and if we can't get it to work, we could always just chat too and um, look at the images that were submitted in the folder already. Okay. I'm happy to do that whenever you... Um, sorry, I'm, I'm just scrambling to find that folder. Um, Let's see. Okay, got it. And feel, feel um, free to email it to me or Megan. Um, either one of us is fine. Okay, I'm just, yeah, I'm going to try to upload it. Let's see. And then, um, okay. because it's so big, I feel like I'd ha I have to upload it no matter what. Okay. Um, do you want to talk about other things and then so I'm not just wasting the time of the of the um of the conversation? I don't want to be. Wasting up the time. Yeah. Yeah, if you wanted to, we could. Um... I need to check. Okay. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say if you wanted to. I know sometimes it can feel like a lot of pressure if everybody's <laughs> kind of watching you do the text. So we were happy to do yeah. the conversation or start the conversation, and then um, when yeah. we have it ready, um, yeah, we could return to it for sure. That's not a problem. Let's do that. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, thank you so much um, to the um, folks who have presented and to Lauren as well. I can't wait to um, yeah, kind of see what you put together. And if nothing else, we could always look at the um, artifact that you submitted to the shared folder as well. Um, either is fine. Um, yeah, I guess to get us started, I'm just going to maybe ask a general question. Um, and let me say first that um, it was just so wonderful the past couple of weeks to read um, all of your work and to hear you talk about it and give it context and um, describe kind of your own attachments to these topics. It was just a real pleasure and honor. So thank you so much um, for your presentations. Um, and I wanted to start, like I said, with just a general question about your work. Um, I think all of your work kind of reminds us that Deserts are often cast as barren um, or as places in need of improvement in the subtle or colonial imaginary, and all of your work um, addresses that in um, you know, different ways. And many of you challenge that idea of the desert as pejorative in your work. And so I was wondering if you could just tell us what interests you about deserts um, and what do you want people to know about them?
Well, I'll start. Um, I, I think that probably everybody in this room um, probably knows these things. In other words, I think we'll probably be preaching to the choir because we all love deserts. But um, I mean, one of the things you, you begin learning very early is how even, even a, a crust of soil that looks quote unquote barren is full of xenobacteria that actually holds everything in place. And sometimes it prevents quote unquote weeds from growing um, and keeps you know, the ecology um, healthy and thriving. So I think, I think that's probably preaching to the choir. I think we probably all know that. But yeah, deserts are just incredible, incredible ecologies uh, full of living things from, from the macro to the micro. And um, I'm going to guess that a lot of you, like me, sort of fell in, in love with the desert maybe as soon as you moved there. I grew up in Idaho. Um, it's actually everything west of the Mississippi is a desert. So we're all living in deserts and they all look different. So I actually grew up in a desert, but I think I didn't know that and as a, a young person. But when I came to the Arizona desert, I just I fell in love and love it. I fell in love too. And it was a surprise to me. I was actually born in South Australia, but I, like most South Australians, clung to the, the coast for a long time. Um, most of most Australian cities are on the coast. There are actually very few large cities um, in the desert regions of our country. And uh, I came late to falling in love with the um, the central deserts of Australia. I did visit Alice Springs when I was a young journalist. I started my career as a journalist before I became an academic. And, um, and I was completely blown away by Alice Springs. Many people have heard of Alice Springs as a sort of a legendary desert city right in the centre of Australia. But I only went to Maralinga um, just over two years ago. I had already written a book about Maralinga uh, and hadn't been there before. But from the moment I got there, I was so overwhelmed I could barely speak. It was so, um, it, it saturated my senses. And I, I, I talk about that a bit in my latest book as well, about uh, how overwhelming um, it felt and how beautiful. I had spoken to scientists in the past who were involved in uh, analysing the contamination from the British tests, and they had said to me how, how beautiful it was and how they loved being there. And I, I found that a bit puzzling. You know, why would you want to be in such a, in, a, in a place that has been ruined in that way? But I understood as soon as I went there myself, it is, uh, it is a very, very beautiful place. Um, since I'm coming from Hiroshima, I'm not uh, so familiar with the desert, I have to say, uh, and I actually uh, got to know the desert through literature, so it might be kind of a different experience, and uh, I read uh, Leslie Mamosilko's work and uh, of course Simon J. J. Ortiz's work and Edward Arby's work and there are many other uh, literature on the desert before uh, I actually went to the southwestern part of America and then experienced it by myself and but because uh, I have been reading Silko's work so much. And Silko's work has been, you know, uh, depicting like so many uh, lives uh, in the desert and, you know, beautiful plants and then like frogs, rattlesnakes. And also she was depicting like uh, how rocks are kind of uh, important, which has uh, stories of its own. So even before I went to the desert, I knew that there are so many things going on. And when I went there, I realized, oh yeah, Silko was right. So that's how I got to know the desert. And I love it so much. And I think the love that all three of you are um, speaking about um, comes through um, in your writing in so many interesting ways. And um, yeah, I wanna see if maybe Lauren, I see that you just popped back in, is there?
And um, maybe not. Sorry. <laughs> Pop back in and out. Yeah. <laughs> But I, yeah, Hi, I, just, Laura, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure if um, you were ready to share your screen yet or. <laughs> Are you talking to me? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I wasn't sure if you were ready to share oh, your screen yet. I saw that you came back in. This has been so epic. Um, my, I have um, the presentation downloading, so it is like a second away, I think, from being being presentable. And I so apologize. I'm totally mortified, frankly. But I don't know. Do not be mortified. <laughs> okay. Very generous. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna try this. Let's see. Oh my god. I really hope this works. Um, Are you seeing uh, like a little Yay. Yay, I can see you. you know. Oh my God. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I'll try to be really quick because I know. Are you still seeing an image? Okay. Hallelujah. So, um, yeah, like, um, so the, the artifact I submitted is the first two chapters of this book, which is a very um, like on the nose kind of engagement with these topics. It's um, an ongoing con con situation that's happening in um, in Arizona. Um, there is a proposed copper mine on um, land that is sacred to the Apache people. And um, so this is a battle that's been going on now for many years um, and is currently in the courts. I can get into a little bit more of those details, but first I just kind of wanted to mention two other projects that um, that um, engage with some of the some of the themes and even places that have been mentioned by our other panelists. Um, my work is a little bit um, unusual. It's like combines nonfiction writing with artwork. So that's what you see there. Um, in this book, um, I use the kind of backbone of like this story of Marie and Pierre Curie, the, the um, scientists and their discoveries in the area of radioactivity um, to connect with um, contemporary issues that we face with nuclear weapons proliferation, um, nuclear medicine and nuclear power. So um, intersecting with some of the things I spent time in Hiroshima interviewing atomic bomb survivors and um, at the Nevada test site um, in, in Nevada. And um, some of the just remarkable as you know, in, along the lines of some things that have come up, um, what just really stunned me about speaking to mining engineers and weapon specialists here, um, and also um, down what they call downwinders, who are the people who, who, um, who literally you know absorbed the atmosphere that came off of these nuclear tests. Sorry, this is so pixelated, but, um, but. Um, so there was this atmosphere around these nuclear bomb tests in this period until until they were made um, until they were outlawed and, and nuclear bomb testing went underground, literally physically underground um, for the period that we where you saw those big mushroom clouds. Um, there was a kind of atmosphere like I think I think it was Liz who mentioned this kind of tourism that we now see at the testing sites. Um, so that that was that was a feature of the atomic bomb testing, even you know, going back to the to the 50s and 60s, where you saw people, you know, local hotels would um, would do like pack up bag lunches and have their guests like, gather on hilltops and watch the atomic bomb testing, and then um, you know, needless to say, animals and people and plants downwind of these tests did not do well. But what I found so stunning about it was that in the name of defense, in we the you know United States bombed its own land and people um, with over a thousand nuclear bombs during this period. Um, in, this is a this is also a different book um, about weather and climate. And I spent time in the Atacama Desert um, for this project. And and um, you know the Atacama is referred to often as as absolute desert, and because it is apparently the driest place on earth. But um, what what I was interested in is when there are these rare rainstorms and um, you do get what's called a blooming desert, which we saw recently in California. And, and that, that idea of dormancy and it, what, what is dormancy kind of, um, um, sh how, how, how dormancy um, belies this idea of barrenness and the kind of abundance that so often the desert offers the abundance of, whether it's flora, fauna, also storytelling um, that 
mythology and um, even like the abundance of darkness, I think is really, really fascinating. And that's one of the things that drew me to the desert in, um, in this other project. So, um, so just to re return to this, um, this situation about Oak Flat. So this, this is the area of Oak Flat and it's in um, what's called the Copper Triangle in, um, in Arizona, which I'm sure you are all familiar with. Um, so this is this is an area where mining has has happened for for a long time, um, obviously displacing indigenous people, um, and um, and so the um, what we see what we see here is um, is the to um, to return to the um, to Australia the same company where where we um, where just recently we saw. Um, Rio Tinto destroy indigenous rock shelters, 46,000 year old continuous habitation, you know, places of continuous habitation at Yukon Gorge. This is the same company that's um, hoping to operate a mine in southeastern Arizona. So um, the the site Oh, so the, sorry, I'm all over the place after after all the technical difficulties, but um, so the artifact that I shared is these first two chapters and what I wanted to do was start kind of zoomed way, way back out in, in literally outer space and ask the question like where, you know, because what, you know, these are resources that are being fought over the copper that's, um, that's so coveted in this location is, um, you know, has, has different values to different, to different communities and populations. And, um, and I, I was just like, what, what is copper? How does it even, how, how do we even have this material on earth? And that led me, you know, to eventually talking to astrophysicists and um, and how literally copper is produced in massive stars as they as they die and um, along with along with other um, minerals and um, and I, this interested me because it, it puts us on different time scales and I think the desert is a place that asks us to kind of think on different time scales um, so this was this kind of um, you know geological time scale and. Um, and so just to give a like the very briefest um, summary of what's happening here, this the um, so in this place at Oak Flat, there is uh, a body of copper ore that's been discovered that's said to be one of the largest copper bodies of copper ore known on Earth. And the copper there would be, you know, worth approximately, depending on the Today's price of copper, $160 billion. So um, there are two mining corporations who have gotten permission from the United States government pending a toothless environmental review that, that they would have access to this. So these are foreign companies. Um, and, and this Apache group led by the man you see here, Wenzel Nosy, and here he is with his wife, Teresa, um, are leading the opposition to this mine. And um, so, the the book looks at the different people, um, you know, who are who are engaged in this in this fight and who are who have, um, you know, deep ties to the land. Um, this is the local town, and um, and this is Oak Flat. Um, and one of the Oak Flat is a Apache burial ground. It's a place where you can find ancient petroglyphs, um, rare water sources in the middle of the desert. So this is kind of incredible oasis with old growth oak trees. And um, it's also, um, you can see dwellings, and it's also the site, um, medicinal plants and foods, also the site of, um, of an important coming of age ceremony for girls. So I saw in the chat earlier, some ideas about masculinity. And it, what's interesting here is that you have um, a matrilineal society and um, where, um, about approximately a year after a girl gets her first menstrual period, she celebrates what's called the sunrise dance. And this is a really important um, event in Apache, in the girl's life, but also in Apache community and culture. And so the, the book, um, you know, these drawings are from sunrise dances that I was invited to. And, um, and the book talks to a number of girls who narrate their, their time, their ceremonies. Um, so I, I want to I want to kind of wrap things up because I know I know we have um, a lot more to talk about. But um, but thank you all so so much for your patience with this technological catastrophe.
Well, Lauren, thank you so much. It was so worth the wait and no worries at all <laughs> um, about the tech issues. They happen all the time. So yeah, no worries at all. Thank you for sharing all of those images. Um, and in your presentation, I mean, you commented on so many of the connections, I think, between all of the presentations and artifacts. And so I want to open up and give um, the four of you the opportunity to maybe talk about some of those connections that you noticed across all of the artifacts. Um, of course, there's the um, kind of issue of temporality, um, how time is maybe, you know, we can think about time in different ways in desert um, spaces. Um, justice comes across in all of your texts. Um, nuclear landscapes, using literature as an entry point um, for thinking about um, deserts, you know, nature and culture coming together. So what were some of the connections that were meaningful for the four of you um, as you were reading each other's work? So I'll 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 just respond. I'll respond to Lauren's uh, presentation. Thank you so much. And please don't worry at all. That has happened to all of us. We've all been there. Um, I'm just really struck by, you know, uh, what I currently research is called cosmovisions or cosmopolitics of indigenous people. So um, it's it's still in the realm of environmental justice, but it really goes into the connections that indigenous people see between the cosmos, um, not defined exclusively as, you know, stars, but defined as you know, cos cosmological in the sense of everything. Everything is the cosmos. We're the cosmos. In fact, the cosmos is humans interacting with the not human. And I love the way your images really um, express what I sometimes refer to as indigenous scientific literacy. So you can take a, a story about, you know, the sisters in the sky, maybe the seven sisters in the sky. Um, but, you know, that story isn't just about seven girls in the sky or the Big Dipper, or the Little Dipper. That story is really about those connections we have to the minerals. It's about the connections we have to the amino acids. It's, it's about the connections that, you know, are everywhere in the cosmos, but everywhere here. And I, I love the way your images express that from, from, you know, copper being formed billions of years ago, but here now at Oak Flat to the changing wo woman ceremony that you attended. Um, it's just, I, I, I just thought that the connections that you expressed in your um, images are really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm I'm certainly uh, and I, I loved Lauren's presentation. In fact, I was blown away by the imagery. I I find myself very moved by this kind of imagery. Um, when I launched my um, earlier book, Atomic Thunder, it was launched at the same time as a as an art exhibition known as Black Mist Burnt Country. Um, which the black mist part of it will give you a clue about uh, the theme of the exhibition. And one of the images that stays with me from that exhibition, and it was mostly indigenous, but some European artistic responses to the um, to atomic matters more generally, particularly in Australia, but also in Japan and in the Pacific. One of the images is, um, and I don't know whether you're familiar with the genre of art known as dot painting, Aboriginal dot painting. Dot painting is a particularly beautiful, ancient form of artistic expression among Aboriginal people in Australia. In the Black Mist Burnt Country was uh, a picture, a beautiful dot painting, and it picked out a mushroom cloud. Now, that still gives me goosebumps when I recall that because there is an ancient, a very ancient, I mentioned 60,000 year old culture um, processing artistically what had happened to them, this absolute catastrophe that had happened to them in, in the middle of the desert. And that was one way that they have um, attempted to process. There is There are so many Aboriginal artistic responses to the displacement and the sickness and the death caused by atomic testing. So uh, I, I find the artistic responses um, particularly moving. 
But, um, but I'll also say that um, the paper that I co-wrote with um, Darren and Leander does deal very much with the ideas of, of deep time and, and very long time scales because Darren is not only an historian of, of uh, matters atomic, he's also a geologist, uh, a, a very interesting combination of expertise. And um, Leander and I were both very inspired by his discussion of how Maralinga was once by the sea. It was once, a, a, you know, right on the coast. It's no longer anywhere near the coast at the moment. However, we know that with climate change, which is another great, you know, human-induced catastrophe, that Maralinga in the not too distant future will be by the sea again with sea level rise. Um, so we also speculate about, you know, the Anthropocene. We, we talk about um, the, uh, the moment when the Anthropocene uh, started. And I know it's a disputed concept and uh, we, we appreciate that. But we tend to think that, um, that the Trinity test in um, July of 1945 um, might be that moment. And, um, and then what happened subsequently at Maralinga and Emu Field and Montebello Islands as well um, contributes to um, a very changed planet. Um, and therefore, I think it's, it's evidence for the Anthropocene. So anyway, um, we, we certainly do engage with the idea of long timescales in that paper. And I know other people here have done this, the same in their different ways. So thank you very much for a very thought provoking panel today. Can I ask a question of Kyoko? Um, in picking up on, on some of this, what you're saying about timescales and, and maybe um, the opposite, I remember um, seeing the photograph that you showed um, just after the bombing of the dev devastated landscape with the um, atomic um, atomic dome. Atomic Dome, right? And um, and then I remember at the um, I think it, at, at the museum in Hiroshima, seeing the one year later photograph of the city and how swiftly so many things had been rebuilt, and I, that I saw found so stunning. And I was wondering what your thoughts are about kind of that devastation, and then um, what happens to that place that debt that you know suddenly created desert and is does it become sacred ground and what how does the rebuilding happen and how you know how to how does the community face that yeah it, it, so after the atomic bombing uh Hiroshima people people who are living in Hiroshima are told that um for 75 years we wouldn't have any plants but even like a year later, we already had a lot of plants growing. So uh, it was kind of, uh, it is quite interesting that, you know, how after the bombing, um, Hiroshima kind of reconstructed itself. And then we have like a lot of plants, like the picture I showed you, like uh, Shuken. And, but then I think uh, uh, the atomic bombing, uh, you know, even we don't know, and I don't know for sure what kind of effect it has on human bodies uh, and what kind of effect it has genetically. And then I don't know as third generation atomic bomb survivor, I'm not sure if it even you know, have some impact on me, but uh, what I can say is it has some impact on our um, mentality, like how we think about the world. So, we cannot escape uh, from like uh, the worries of uh, radiation. We cannot escape from worries about uh, contamination by the uh, nuclear energy. And that's how uh, atomic bombs had some kind of uh, uh, impact on uh, Hiroshima people, I think. So even though we have like uh, a lot of plants, that doesn't necessarily mean that you know, people who uh, experienced the bombing uh, recovered completely from what had happened 
happened. And then I am one of the good example because I started to see some kind of a trans-Pacific and transnational connections uh, between Hiroshima and then other places where uh, radiation has affected or where uh, nuclear energy has some uh, impact upon. And then uh, I actually think that uh, deep time, the idea of deep time is very, uh, very important and it's connected to all of our talk. And um, I thought that um, I read uh, all of your work. And then when I was uh, reading Liz's paper, and I was actually thinking how your idea is actually connected to what Silko has been talking about in many of her uh, works. And in fact, she talks about, you know, the star being. So I don't know exactly how it looks like, but then uh, Silko drew a picture of the star being. And I was actually uh, thinking about Lauren's picture, uh, you know, at the beginning of the, uh, the the first picture you have been showing us. And then, the, you know, the stars and then how uh, the cosmic uh, energy is kind of connected to what's going on in the earth, on the earth as well. And Silko basically says the star beings brought uh, water to the earth so it might have like you know uh came to the earth and then it just uh i don't know if it's like a meteor or you know some kind of the planet that you know crashed upon the earth but the star being brought some water and then she basically says um we can find like uh seashells and so many things in the sand dunes in the desert in the southwestern desert area so uh, I think Liz was talking about that in, in Australian uh, landscape as uh, geological feature as well, right? So uh, in the Southwestern desert, we can find seashells. So that actually means that the desert in this area uh, in the uh, Southwest uh, has been and will be again the ocean if you look at uh, this place uh, with you know the concept of deep, time so so that's what i was thinking when i was listening to and when i read uh all of your work sorry i talked too much <clears throat> no kind of thinking about the concept of deep time too and um that maybe leads to my last question before we open it up to dialogue um i was kind of wondering um holding kind of the future in mind what nuclear justice in desert environments might look like um and how you treat nuclear justice maybe in your work um as humanists as historians as um you know literary critics and artists um so what does nuclear justice look like um what might a justice informed infrastructure look like in desert environments um and whose voices and um you know kind of um experiences might be able to contribute to um, those conceptions of justice in desert environments. Or we can just open it up to dialogue if you prefer. <laughs> I, I'm just thinking about it because yeah. um, it's it's a difficult one. Um, some of these things are irredeemable. <clears throat> you know, they, they can't be fixed. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I mean, in Australia, certainly there um, have been some very incomplete attempts to compensate Aboriginal people. So at uh, after the Royal Commission in, in the 80s, uh, a, a case was put to the Commonwealth of Australia, the government, to compensate, and that did happen. Um, and as a result, the settlement at Oak Valley was able to be um, properly set up, and it continues to be, a, I won't say thriving, it's still a struggling community in many ways of survivors and, and their, you know, the uh, next generations. But at least they, um, they, it's a very traditional community and they're bringing back their traditions in, in very fruitful ways. So I guess that's something. But what is more interesting to me is the way Indigenous people here have, have reclaimed their agency and the, um, the tourism operation is one manifestation of that. 
but there's also, um, you know, there are some very vibrant, engaged Aboriginal activists who, you know, I'm thinking particularly of Karina Lester, who has is the, the daughter of Yami Lester, who was a survivor of the Black Mist and a great activist himself who died recently. Um, but Karina has taken the case to the United Nations in New York. She's actually presented there. Um, and I think she is a, a great and important voice for Aboriginal people um, it, when they're trying to reclaim what they lost and to seek justice. But whether there's perfect justice here, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure that there is. I think um, that's really interesting. And I, I definitely don't have an answer to your question, Jada, at all. But just to kind of further maybe complicate it or to bring in like from the idea of like weapons fallout to power and infrastructure and energy is, you know, your question made me think of Chernobyl and a lot of the different things that have come up made me think of like the zone of exclusion, right? It's not a desert in the sense of a desert that we, you know, would would picture in our mind, but it is a kind of, um, abs you know, there's a, an absence of life in a certain way, but there are also but that's complicated by the people who didn't leave and by the animals that are still there and by the plants that are still there, by the way they've mutated, by the toxicity that remains. Um, and also of course, by the war now. And um, and I think like, I, I don't have an answer, but that's just sort of an as association. But then in terms of um, justice, I think it like at, for one of the things that, um, drew me to the topic of, of Oak Flat and, the, and copper is because copper is considered um, the metal of the information age. It's part of clean energy, right? If we want to um, transition from fossil fuels to clean energy, we are going to need much more copper. And what does that mean for resource extraction? And, and what you see from these industries is a kind of greenwashing effect where they use this environmentalist rhetoric to, um, to steamroll indigenous voices and to steamroll the, the genuine environmentalism that, um, that would counter the project because we know these companies aren't interested in um, protecting the landscape or human rights, but um, they use that language and then politicians echo it and we see it enacted in policy. Um, so I think that's, a, that's a real, just a, a point of danger that for us to be aware you know, for the conversation. Um, uh, I remember, uh, Johnny, uh, in your book, you are talking about like how uh, different ways justice works. So justice is not only uh, one thing. So when I think about nuclear justice, I think it's like nuclear uh, justice is kind of so uh, from uh, when you in Hiroshima, uh, we have this master narrative that Hiroshima citizens are kind of the victims of the atomic bomb. Partially it's true, but at the same time, it's kind of a dangerous uh, idea as well, because uh, when we focus on uh, the um, fact that, you know, only Hiroshima people suffered from the atomic bomb, that is not true. And then uh, it is kind of uh, important to notice that um, nuclear justice uh, should be done to everyone, not only like for the people who suffered from the atomic bomb. And in order to do that, I think as a Hiroshima citizen, we have to realize that Hiroshima citizens or even Japanese citizens were uh, kind of the, uh, well, were also the people who brought harm to other people because of uh, nuclearism. For example, uh, Japan, Japan has a lot of nuclear power plants and then some of the nuclear waste, uh, we don't know what to do. And some people, you know, the government is talking about dumping nuclear waste in uh, the Pacific Ocean. And uh, in fact, uh, many years ago, uh, we had a uranium mine, and then the nuclear waste uh, from Japan has been brought to uh, Navajo people, Navajo people's land in the Southwest. So um, nuclear 
injustice is quite uh, transpacific and transnational. And then uh, I feel uh, personally, I feel uh, that I need to realize that uh, there are some nuclear injustices, injustices I am doing just by living and then using electricity and then, you know, living in Japan where there are so many nuclear power plants. May I, may I make a comment or is it too early for that? No, since we have about 20 minutes left, I say we just open it up and, um, yeah, see what questions y'all have. So go right ahead, Gary. Um, I, I have no right to uh, speak to this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, <laughs> um, one irony that strikes me in a conversation about about justice um, is that um, very often the term of it is uh, is situated in capitalism. It's all about money, evaluating the financial um, damage that's been done and then allocating money in order to compensate for that damage. And it strikes me that that really um, doesn't even get at justice issues of indigenous peoples for whom questions about the sacrality and numinousness of landscapes is part of the, um, is part of the issue. And there's no way that you can correlate a, a, a monetary figure with damage to um, a landscape of sacrality, so that there's a talk in a way of cross purposes and the and authorities that are looking at 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 even the best media authorities that are looking at some kind of justice do are doing it through a capitalist lens. Um, that's all um, Euro American. And, and kind of completely misses what the fundamental issue is, it seems to me anyway, which I say is, you know, not being an indigenous person. God, I didn't mean to kill the conversation. Well, I'll pick up on that and just say like, in terms of the ways that capitalist rhetoric and collapses narratives, I think that this, um, panel and this dialogue, one of the things that's so generative are all of the different languages, disciplines, and ways of approach, and even how Joni started talking about sacrifice zones and fences and ways of looking at power and power coming from the earth and hot springs, and then looking at this idea of dormancy and the seeding of abundance, right, or the um, and just the ways that that all of you bring a sort of complicating aspect to some of the um, rhetoric of justice, right, that can get collapsed for capitalist purposes. So I think there's so much richness in, in this dialogue. So I just wanted to say thank you. I just feel like I should add a word about creosote in the desert. Um, after all the years of bombing in the Nevada desert, uh, creosote, which can live up to 17,000 years, in some places it's been dated to 12,000 years. It's a clonal plant and it keeps growing out in rings. And even with all of that bombing, somehow the creosote managed to survive. And so it reminds me a lot of, of um, what um, Lauren just mentioned about um, Chernobyl. Um, despite all of the destruction, something keeps going. And it could be, you know, to, just to connect to what Gary just said, it's part of the sacredness of earth. You know, like how does that creosote? And interestingly, among the Autumn people here in the desert Southwest, the creosote is considered to be the kind of creator of the earth. So if, if any of you know creosote very well, you know that it has all these resins in it. And those resins have been used, you know, to co coat telephone poles, just to keep the telephone poles from uh, degrading. Be so it's this sticky sort of resin. And, and it said among the Otham that, um, that that resin was taken by some insects 
and formed into little mountains, which then became the big mountains that are here in the desert southwest. So the creosote is connected to the creation story of both the earth and of the Otham people themselves. The Otham people have probably been here in the desert for a, at least 12,000 years, if not longer. And so, I don't know, I just, I, the mention of Chernobyl and the idea of justice, I can't really answer the question about what a nuclear justice would look like, but it 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 has to have something to do, you know, with these amazing processes that are, you know, part of this place we call the Earth. Yeah, CJ. Oh, great! This is <laughs> this is amazing. Um, I get to ask a question. So I, I've been thinking a lot um, recently about, about deep time. And so this is a perfect panel to hear your thoughts about this. I'm very, so eager to hear what you have to say. I, I've been thinking about the, the extent to which our sense of deep time chronology in the past is very closely tied to nuclear physics in the 1940s which is the same process that sort of gave us this nuclear, this like endless nuclear holocaust, you know, in the future. And so as we use these terms, like for 12,000 years or for 60,000 years, like that's coming out of the same history of science in terms of like how to identify unstable isotopes and use that to actually put chronological time to, to make to make time precisely chronological as opposed to just relative. And so the, I guess the related question to that that I've been thinking about is once you get into deep time, truly deep time, back into like Archean or Hadean or like the deep future, question, it, to me, it complicates questions of justice um, and it complicates questions of anthropocentrism in the sense that it doesn't really matter anymore um, or, or arguably like one could take that perspective because it's so, it's so massive. And so I guess the, the question that I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts on um, pertains to, the, to that set of ideas, but also indigeneity. What difference does it make to say that people have been in Australia for 60,000 years versus 12,000 years in the autumn case, or I think much more difficult, the, the Athapaskan speaker case, which may be only 800 years. So is what matters just predating settler colonialist technology, or is what matters having a cosmovision that is not tied to, to extractivism and to, to a disconnect between the, the, um, between the human and the non-human world? And of course, people have been in Japan for thousands of years as well, and you're indigenous you know, in that regard. So could you, could you speak, panelists, please, to, to that? Um, to that set of questions. Thank you. Uh, maybe I can start by uh, sharing my uh, favorite author's work. Of course, Leslie Mamosilko's uh, work. So Leslie Mamosilko uh, has been um, talking about how, like I said, the desert is part of the ocean. So uh, eventually the ocean will reclaim the land. So from that perspective, it seems like, oh, human beings not, you know, don't matter at all. But she actually add uh, saying, uh, she, she actually add by saying that uh, before the ties of the ocean uh, comes, comes back and reclaim the land, the indigenous movement, indigenous ties will come back. That's what's going to happen. And I think uh, even before, you know, we, we are thinking about like uh, deep time and like before, you know, or after human beings, but also uh, Siyoko is thinking about uh, the indigenous uh, time span of the human beings, I think, and then how, you know, the cycle, I don't know how to put it, but, you know, the cycle of it, of indigenous movement is coming, indigenous uh, people's uh, movement coming back, just like the earth uh, 
movement uh, of the ocean is coming back. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but I just wanted to share what, but I, what I learned from Circo's work. Um, I, I somehow missed your question a little bit because my internet is unstable. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be answering this exactly what you asked, but I'm going to, I'm going to give it a shot. Um, I'm just going to speak to the activists, indigenous activists that I work with today. And essentially what they say is that they've already survived the apocalypse. The apocalypse started, you know, as soon as settler colonials started coming over and colonizing the land. And so, so they have a lot of knowledge and scientific literacy about how ecosystems work. And so what they say is that we should be looking to them because they actually have a lot of knowledge about how to survive an apocalypse. <laughs> Um, and it's really true, you know, when you think about the ways in which different nations are literally sort of rewilding places, they're buying back land, they're, you know, participating in the land back movement, um, they're resisting uh, at Black Mesa, look at what happened at Black Mesa, um, uh, Oak Flats, you know, um, it's, 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 it's them that we should be looking towards um they say so i i think that's a really interesting idea you know they have survived the apocalypse if we want to understand how to sort of um set milestones uh that we achieve whether those are the sdgs or whether there are other kinds of milestones you know the peoples that we should be looking towards for leadership are the indigenous peoples and i'll just jump oh. in and add to that just uh, um uh, a, a, kind, a very brief anecdote that Emu Field, which uh, I talked briefly about, uh, was part. It was unsuitable for future tests, partly because of the the lack of water, and the British had to fly in water by aircraft. And water, of course, is extremely heavy and very difficult to move. The Anigu people had been mapping the water sources in that area for tens of thousands of years. And in fact, their beautiful artwork often shows the, um, the soaks and, and the other places where water can be found. Um, but the British would not have even thought to have asked them. And, you know, you have to wonder whether they would have um, told them truthfully, um, knowing what um, the British were up to. Um, so it's just that, that complete disconnect between people who have a deep understanding of um, their land and are deeply connected to it and the colonial people who come in over the top of that with their um, allegedly superior technology and yet they can't even manage the most basic of survival necessities such as water if if i may if i may jump in one more time um, on this question of deep time which i think is is culturally complicated um, I've been doing some reading recently on uh, by uh, Indigenous Australian authors, um, and one of the things I've learned from from that is um, a sense that for um, um, at least some Indigenous Australians, and I think Liz and Libby can probably speak better to this than I can, um, that 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 all times are simultaneous. The future, the present, and the past are all happening right now. Dreaming is not just a deep past phenomenon, but it's a present phenomenon too. So that, that when we talk as archeologists or historians about 60,000 years of human occupation in Australia or 12,000 years in the US Southwest, we're also doing so from a, a, a cultural point of view that, um, um, that, that might be very different if you ask um, an indigenous person about that deep time. Um, so I think that, that, that to talk about that and think about that is a complicated issue. And you have to also consider the cultural stance from which um, um, you're contemplating a deep past or, or a deep future. And I want to give Lauren the chance to respond to Lauren, I noticed that you oh, were going yeah. to speak up a second ago. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that idea of, of 
like um, what time are we thinking about past, present, future? And then, and I think, you know, talking to um, indigenous people, you hear often um, the conversation, you know, which is implies sort of today, to use today's jargon, the idea of sustainability, right? The idea of um, seven generations ahead. So not so much um, thinking about the past, but also thinking about those yet to be born. Um, and and um, and I think that goes to the the value system that Gary is suggesting, right? Like if if our value system is a, on a in a capitalist framework that completely changes, um, you know, what what choices are made. And I was just going to put in the chat um, a recent article that was in the New Yorker um, about what defines indigenous. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really it's really good. It, um, it's because a lot of the the definitions are actually you know kind of slippery when when you um, when you start to dig in. Great. It looks like we have time for maybe one more question. And Alec, I see that you have your hands up. So if you'd like to ask your question, go ahead. Awesome. Great. First off, amazing panel. Thanks for being here. Um, and my question is for um, specifically Professor Adamson, but anyone else can chime in. Um, so Professor, I read your um, your uh, artifacts on the eco-criticism. And one thing that kind of struck with me was the um, garden fi everything. I, I, I don't know if I'm interpreting that right, but like the whole like treating sacred spaces as distant and um, by treating these natural spaces as distant as kind of counter and do it counter and counter counterproductive and leaves behind the people who actually live in those places. So the task has become to gardenify everything. And I that's a term I really came to appreciate from Charles C. Mann in the book 1491, where this America was basically a giant garden. Anyway, um, so I just want to make sure I'm getting that right. But my question is about that, um, your book, your chapter on Samuel Ortiz, the labor, like the um, his father plowing the garden. And it's through labor that we understand the environment around us. And that was true for the indigenous. And it's true for Samuel Ort uh, Simon Ortiz and the present, the indigenous of the past and the indigenous of the current day. So I was just wondering if you could maybe uh, go a little more into the whole, the through labor, we know nature and the garden fi everything. Yeah, that's, uh, you're, so you're talking about the, the piece in the book where I talk about a garden ethic, yes. which just recognizing, as you say, that um, when the settler colonials first arrived, what they didn't see, they, there was so much they didn't see so most of the landscape had was tended by uh, people who lived um, in places, and that, of course, was not was not seen by them because they came in and they thought they were seeing paradise or seeing, you know, Eden. Um, they they were really shaped by their own sort of narratives, biblical narratives, for example. Um, so from from North North America all the way down to South America, the ways in which people um, interacted with the landscape, whether that's a forest with, you know, um, fires, you know, uh, cultural fires, or it is a garden, say, in the Amazon, where the, the gardens are typically vertical, things grow up. And so, you know, um, the colonizers came in and they didn't recognize that. They said, there's no gardens here. Uh, therefore, it, we're justified in taking over this place. And so, the, and then to get to your question about work, um, the point I was making there was one that I think somebody has already made here today, which is that, you know, if we're using our computers, then we might be using coal, coal energy, you know, coal burned energy. Uh, we, you know, depending on where our, our power has come from or copper in our, in our phones, in our computers, we're all sort of implicated in this work that's being done to create technology. And so we just need to become more aware of what it is that our work is doing in the world, how we, how we shape and reshape the world through work of any kind, whether it's at a computer or it's in a garden, um, we just need to become more aware of the ways in which you know, our, 
all of our work is implicated in um, what's going on with with the climate. I hope Somewhere. that yeah, I hope that answers your question. Awesome. And that was oh, such totally. a wonderful, yeah, that was such a wonderful response, I think, to in the conversation with. Sadly, it looks like, <laughs> like we're um, <laughs> um, but we went into this conversation kind of with the broad themes of energy and infrastructure in mind, and we ended up having all kinds of related conversations about temporality and justice and the sacred. And um, all of you have really just kind of broadened and expanded our understanding of um, desert environments in so many rich ways um, from so many disciplinary perspectives. So we really want to thank you um, for um, for that and for allowing us to see the desert um, for you know kind of all of its layers. Um, and I also wanted to share that our Dialogue number three is coming up on October 3rd, or not October, but August 30th, um, and I'll share with you the flyer really quickly, and I'll also email this to everyone as it has the registration link, um, just like um, the flyer for Dialogue 2 did, and we have five speakers in Dialogue 3. Let me see if I can share the screen really quickly. Um, and a few of those speakers are here with us right now. So wonderful to see them here. Um, so dialogue number three is going to explore um, the topic of ethics in the desert, very broadly speaking. Um, and we have five speakers, Mika Kennedy, um, Julian Saparidi, Sarah Salmai Habib, Delisa Miles, and Kevin McHugh. Um, so we hope to see you um, at that event. It's taking place also on a Wednesday from four to six Arizona time. Um, so again, thank you so much for being with us. Um, this afternoon and this morning for some of you. Um, and have a wonderful start to your day, folks in Japan and Australia, and have a wonderful evening for those of you um, in the US. Thank you so much for being here. It's been a real pleasure. Bye. Bye. <laughs>